So, yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I've discovered that living with somebody is difficult. What made you choose music? Well, I don't even think, in a way, I had a choice because my father and my mother were both musical people anyway. And my father was very passionate about this country and about the culture, the pre-colonial culture of this country. He was really, he, he, he was a really strong thing in his heart. And he, um, so as I was learning to speak, um, mama, dada, all of those things, he started teaching me songs in Irish. And I didn't know it was, I didn't know there were songs, I didn't know it was a language, you know, I, it was just something me and my dad did. And so it was a seed that was sown into my, into me. And, and that was music. And so there, and then there was a piano in the house and I'd always go and play, the, just, just play with the piano and watch people playing, watch my mother. My mother was a really good piano player. My father likes to play the piano. I used to think he was better than my mother because he was my father, but my mother told me, no, no, no he's not. <laughs> Darling, no. <laughs> Listen, and, and so I learned something from that, but my father loved music, and and, uh, and he loved that sort of relationship between a people, the land and music and language. He loved that thing, and he understood it. And cho but he chose to live in the capital city, he chose to live in Dublin, which is not a very, obviously, it's not, the culture isn't the centre, obviously there, anyway, you know. But I think, so I think I always felt, and I was always singing, and I, you know, the, like my brother and I, we'd come down and we'd sing for visitors in the house. If my parents came home with friends late at night, they'd wake us up and we'd come down and we'd sing and um, there was an, it was just always an automatic natural kind of thing so I didn't have to think about it I was I didn't know I, I went to school I did 12 years of school and then I went to uh, university because that's what my parents wanted me to do I didn't really have a vision for myself in university um, and so I uh, I was kind of trying to tell my dad, okay, I will get, I, I will, re if you, you know, he said, promise to me if you repeat this year that you'll try harder. And I, 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 I promise him, but not with my heart. I just go, yeah, I promise. Then a band formed around me and uh, I could see the road. I just saw the road. I said, this, this, this is the answer. This is something that will sow the seeds of of my way of life and uh, and I said to my dad you know and he was doubtful he said well no you should do you should do university first and then I said but I waste time and you know I'm good I said, <laughs> you know you know I'm good at this and he gave it to me but you know the way parents you know it's just it's a puzzle we're always figuring it out and so anyway I ran with the band and that was it and that was and so the band took me so many places and but it also took me into a very dark place which was uh, realizing that you can be manipulated by people and that people are ruthless and that record the, the, the record industry is like them is like a mining industry it's just they see the land they get the geologist in and they figure out okay there's there's the stuff let's go and let's just get it and uh, I could only survive that for seven years and then I had to pull away and I did and now now I now I feel like I'm a, a maturing musician who who I still have to do my best work do you think that that separation from um, the industry m make things harder for you as as no. a performer no no it does make things like no i mean yeah no definitely not um when i was in you know when we were 
lot when we had a record company and we were appearing on TV and which we still you know it still it still all happens but in those days we were being driven by people we didn't even know the faces we didn't even see at all and I, I just couldn't live with that I couldn't sleep with that and you feel like you lose control over your own life life yeah life you know and I, my life is first I mean my life and then if I have a family it's my family's life but life first and then and music is is, is on the altar of my life but but not not the music business not that there were, you know money was probably less I, ne I didn't have to think about money but I was younger you never have to think about your money when you're younger to the same degree now I've got two, two children and I've got divorce and, and, a, and a relationship and I used to have got an old, a house to pay for and then another house to, to pay for and I don't know month to month how it's going to work but, but it does work so I don't worry I make a choice not to worry and so far that's that's okay and I, I, think, I, I make the best music you know I'm just the happiest I think that that reflects uh, in your music the way you live the way you choose to live mm. you, you show you really show your your soul in it yeah. it's truly nakedness of when you just choose to live your life the way you want and not let fame or money or anything else control you I think so yeah uh, how do you cope with being on the road in your family life well These days, on the road, I mean, I left my home this morning, and I'll probably go back tonight. Um, and then I go to Galway tomorrow, and then I'll go back. So it works. I mean, there are no, f I don't think there are any fixed rules about anything, including family. I mean, so, yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I've discovered that living with somebody is difficult and uh, so you know one thing feeds the other I um, I, I go away I, the maximum that I will go away for now is three weeks away from my family and that's really pushing it that's um, they sound great um, but but you know I'll go away for four days five days and then sometimes I'll bring them with me and I'd like to bring them with me more because we work well as a family actually when we're on the road because I'm, I know what I'm doing so my role is clear and, and we just set up camp wherever we are but, but yeah, family life isn't, isn't easy when you're, when you're a dad or a mom I think it's, and, and, and living with somebody you know, bringing your, your habits and your, your face, your non-public face, you know, that's, that's not easy. And I respect anyone who can keep, keep, keep going with it. Um, one, I have one failed marriage, um, but it wasn't, that wasn't because of rock and roll. That was because of just me and her, you know, that was us. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess really. Are you, your children musical? Yeah. Yeah, my daughter's seven, my son is 18. And my, he's doing the leaving now, so his head is down on that, working on that. But uh, he's a nice singer, he knows music. He's seen, he's been around it, and I'm starting to see, he's just, he's, he's great. You know, he's just got his own understanding and discipline. He's more disciplined than I am, and he likes to write, so... Then my daughter's seven, so she's just like singing all the time. <laughs> you know, she's it's entertaining and it's a kind of it's an energy, yeah, yeah, yeah fun, she's fun and and really cool. How does your writing process work? Uh, what inspires you? Well, I like I mean, inspiration comes, and I, I I guess I like to be relaxed and I like. Sometimes if, if I'm in a room and there's people and, and there's an instrument and the sound is good and I can be inspired to create something there and then, um, everything inspires me.
love is a big thing I mean I think I like this I like simplicity I don't like trying too hard to say something um, but I like to say a load of stuff and see what I'm saying and look back and go oh that, that's what I'm saying oh that could mean that and that. I like seeing meaning appear from stuff that might not have obvious meaning I like that. Um, from um, all the musicians that inspired um, your genre of music and um, the way you play mm -hmm. now um, who, who do you think was the strongest influence on you? Well, there are a few, but Sean Oriada. Did you, do you know him? No. Sean Oriada, he was born in Limerick in probably 1920. Well, he died in 1970. He was only 40. So 40, so around 1930, 1929, 1930. He, uh, he was born John Reedy in, in Adair, which is, which is a town in Limerick on the road to Kerry. Uh, his mother came from a lot of, there was a lot of classical music in his family and a lot of traditional music as well. And he followed, he grew up He went to school in Cork, and in fact, he went to school with my father. But um, they, he then went to UCC, to the University College Cork, and studied composing, studied the form of, of composing, and was m mainly interested in European modern music. So quite strange music, not melodic, not... But he was also... He was a, a people person. He loved people, and so he played jazz, and he played, and he, he also had a growing, quietly growing interest and understanding of Irish music. And then he worked in RTE as a director of music, and he worked in the Abbey Theatre as the director there. So he got good at working out arrangements quickly. And then he went down to West Kerry on his holidays, to the Gaeltacht you know, where the language is still spoken and it blew his mind. He just, he just, he found God. Like he found his, he found his purpose. And, and I'm, I'm still living his purpose, I think, somehow. Um, he, he, changed, he, he changed his name back to the original Irish. So from John Reedy, he became Sean Oriada. And he had composed already work for a famous, uh, film of the time called Misha Eire, which was a whole uh, a kind of a film that was made of archive music, archive footage of revolution, of the uprising. And uh, he, uh, he put together a band, and the band was called Kjoltori Hulin. And it was pipes, fiddle, three fiddles, He played the harpsichord, he had a baron player, a bones player, an accordion player, and himself. And yeah, no, I have him there. So eight, I think around eight people. And they, so when mm, they made a record, a live album in the Gaiety Theatre that my parents were at in 1969, I think it was, or 68 maybe. And it became a record, and my dad took it home on a cassette, and we listened to it at home. And it's just trad, but it's arrangements that have power. And he did something. He he awoke. He brought the traditional music that that all over Ireland people were familiar with, but in Dublin, there's they're constantly their backs are being turned, you know, against it. Because they're looking over to England, they're looking over to Europe. So he brought this music back and reminded people, this is yours, this is your honey, this is your stuff. And uh, and so and and, and when you when you hear that record, it's just Oriada Sigeti. The Gaiety Theatre is where they where they played this gig. You hear something happening, you hear an awakening. They hear the crowd going mad. Now, obviously, a lot of people who went knew the music, 
they were already fans. They were already, they were converted. You were saying about um, the cassette your, yeah. your, your dad brought home. So he brought home and we listened to it and it just be, it became the backbone and it was just, some, that's what I want to do. That's, that's, that's what I want to do. That's what I can, that was my voice. I, that was, I, I heard a voice there that I could have. That I could, that I could, I could impress people. I don't know why. You know all those different things a kid thinks of. It, it's strange though, because you're young, and the musical influence around. I don't know if it was because in your house might have been different, but all the pop music, as you said, coming from England, and you chose traditional Irish. Well, I did, but I didn't. I mean, eventually. Uh, yeah, the pop, but I don't know. That was just say that was home, and I didn't have to think twice about it. And then there was pop music, and I and like punk music came when I was fourteen, fifteen. And there was incredible musicians like Ian Dury and the Sex Pistols and the Stranglers and people who who were artistic but might never have tried an instrument. Now we're trying an instrument because during that era, being bad was as good, was as important as being good. So if you could make, and you could put your, if you, I mean, you, you realize, that, that was a real awakening of the realization. You put your mind to something, you can make great things, and you don't have to follow the path of 15 chords or, or, or eight, eight beats to three bars or you know you don't have to it doesn't have to be intellectual but you can still I think architecture came you know there was like just really clever use of electric guitar and reinvent like at, at the point where punk music came rock and roll had come so far and it had become very clever There'd been a lot of very, really clever music. And there was still, disco music was happening, which was fabulous. Elvis had just died. Elvis Presley had just died. But the whole, the record industry was becoming, control was controlling everything. And it was getting a bit predictable. And suddenly these guys came with this crazy idea. And there was people who, and there was people who could play. And there was... It wasn't all about bad, but, but there was something, and I loved that. And there was an identity as well. You cut your hair and you made it spiky. <laughs> you wore your dad's clothes. I wore my dad's coat. And I, you know, it was like about, about being ugly. It was about being <laughs> like nass or, you know, it could be violent if you wanted it. I, I, I didn't go, I wasn't interested in that. I wasn't, that wasn't, the central thing was just attitude and not, not respecting Authority was a big part of it. You know, authority was dis was. You just went. It was a it was a, it was a fad for many. Some people central to it. It was a passion and it was real. It was like no authority. We have to question our par authority. This is important. But to many of us, it was just like. It, it looks was, cool. It looked cool <laughs> exactly. And when you're fifteen, that's that's the mo the main thing. But and then at that same time, Bob Marley and the Whalers was coming in and so that was like really that really actually that mixed everything up for me um, the whole philosophy behind the music as well yeah. the lifestyle and the and the maturity of the, of the groove was, you know it wasn't fast and crazy it was like whoa there was a lot of room to meditate to this music is there um a song that you wrote that you would say this is me this is the song that defines me or in the other hand is there a song that you wrote that you were never happy really happy with it uh, yeah I mean I, I, I could look at I could look at loads of songs that I that I that if, if I had given it more time I probably could have made them better I was a harder worker. I felt I used to once the inspiration came, I'd run, almost like it's done, it's done, don't touch, <laughs> don't, don't, don't touch it. But 
Um, no, I don't, I mean, the nice thing about playing solo is that I'll, I'll play songs that I wrote with, with the band. And, uh, but because I'm solo, I'll play them differently, so I'll see different, I'll get different energies from it. And, uh, so that keeps it alive. That does really keep it inspir inspiring. And uh, so that sometimes I go, this really, this song really does resonate with me. It really, I know why I wrote that song then, and I'm, you know, and I'm, I, it gets me in touch with that per that person and brings. And every night, like every time I have a good gig, it feels like the best gig ever. So it, it, it's it's that. The amazing thing about music is that I think that when when you hit that sweet sweet spot, um, it's 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 always it's always new. Have you um, you obviously played a lot of venues and a lot of festivals? Was there a place that um, stayed with you, um, either for a good reason of a bit or a bad reason, and where? Oh yeah. Loads, yeah. There's there's a there's a place in well there's a place in a hotel in a certain town in Ireland and I really don't know how come we play there three times in a row. Because it's it's just a it's just wrong. But we played one famous place that we played was Wembley Arena, which is an indoor arena. They do horse jumping there, it's a famous it's a famous arena. And I remember, I remember liking country music. You know, my parents were out. I was babysitting for my brother. I was 15, 11 or 12. And there was a country music festival on TV and it was in Wembley Arena. And it made me like country music. Until then, I had no time for it. And then I did. But when we were on the road, the band, uh, my manager said that our agent wanted us to play Wembley Arena now. We'd done the Hammersmith Odeon, now it's time to do Wembley Arena, it's just part of the process. I said, no, 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 I don't want to do it, I don't want to do it, I don't want to, I don't want to go, I don't want to get bigger, I want to get better, that's what I, I want to, let's play three Hammersmiths Odeon instead of one Wembley Arena. He said, well, he really wants to do this, you know, it's not, it's not necessarily the way you think, you know, and um, I said, he said, what would make it better for you? And I said, well, think about what would make it better for you and, and let's, let's, let's talk about it. So I thought about it and I went, okay, and I never got on with our manager at that time, and, but that was the one time we actually we agreed on something. I said, okay. Or he turned me around in a way that I felt rather than surrendered to. <laughs> you know, and um, there was plenty of that. But And I, one of the things, a very simple thing, I did a couple of drawings. I did like a dolphin. I did a, a, an island. I did a kind of a, an, an image that would have come from a Celtic cross. I did just stuff that I felt was symbolic, but didn't think too much about it. I did a load of drawings and then our lighting guy, he took them and he got them, he reproduced them into big banners that were this size and that if you shone uh, ultraviolet light, they lit up. So, and these were all around, they made a hall out of Wembley Arena. They just, they enveloped this thing and I just looked at that. Imagine that it was beautiful. It was really, well for me too, you know, just, yeah, just like, and the, the, the childlike aspect that I had just drawn it and they just made it bigger. I felt it contact, it connected with my child actually somehow, that these were my pictures on the wall. But of, of, from, from the hand of a child really, not, that's, that's, that's a, feeling, or a feeling I have. And we played that night and all our families came to that show, you know, they came over from Ireland and into London, the capital city of big empire, you know, the history of pain and control and 
And we came and we shook that place. We rocked it. And I sang a traditional song. I sang a song called Carrick Fergus. I might sing it tonight. And, uh, and the place was silent. And it was like 13,000 people silent <laughs> listening to this song that is in Irish and English, in two lang- you know, in both languages. And I thought, fuck me, that's great. <laughs> and so that's, yeah, that would be a real high point. That, that yeah. How was uh, the first time that you were on stage playing to massive number of people? How was that feeling for you to have your your music heard by so many? Yeah, wonderful. I, but I think whether you're playing to ten or ten thousand, if you're having a good gig, then you're having a good gig. Now, when you're having a good gig in front of twenty thousand people or thirty or forty thousand people. It feels pretty, it's a pretty powerful feeling, but the musical experience is still that intimate experience and you might still go to the bar or to a room with eight other people and and have a song that, that will just be as beautiful and as powerful. This big thing is, uh, it's, it's very attractive, I mean it's, I can understand how you... But I, I just did not want to... I could see that our management and the band wanted to only play in these big stadiums and do the U2 thing. And I had to say no, even though maybe if it was a different set of people or a different set of rules, I think a different management was, was my problem. But no, I don't even think that. I just didn't want to be locked where I was responsible for a hundred people and that they were expecting me to sing this song at this time say this thing at this time and that everything had to be tied up and, and someone said to me um, the other day about your band um, that you could be now as big as you two that something happened and then it didn't happen for you and um, the same person said I think it's a bit of Liam. He didn't want to be that faceless band. Yeah. That's pretty much it. Like, I didn't. I said no. And I remember that there was a day now... We were in Washington, D.C., on the road, and our manager came over. He wasn't with us all the time. Oh, he was a tough character. And he sat, and he, I just found him really hard to even sit side but um, he said so I want to know what you guys want what you guys want you know and I said well I don't want I don't want that I don't want those stadiums and he kind of laughed as if you wish you know oh yeah you wish you'd you'd get that far but but I said it and I think in saying it I think I did I think we'll still be as big as you two, but it won't be a different. It'll be just a different. It'll be, it'll be different. Um, I think play what plays a lot is people's egos. They believe that if I'm not extremely famous or extremely rich, or if I'm not playing the huge gigs, I didn't really make it. Yeah, but and I don't even think that's not even. I mean, it takes ego to believe that you're making it. That I'm. I feel I'm making it right here. That's ego in a way too. I mean, that, that there's a certain arrogance in that. So, and there's a certain naivety and innocence in thinking that it's about how many numbers are on the bank balance and how big the crowd is. And that's that's another game. But uh, yeah, I mean, I ego is an interesting. It's a it's a it's an elusive thing. But then. Um I think when people pursue this illusion of fame and I, I want to be famous and I want to be rich, I want to play for thousands and thousands of people, the music gets lost though, isn't Can it? Can do, yeah. Because you're not really doing it because you're passionate about it anymore. Especially if you're clinging to it, yeah. yeah. It's a trick. It's another trick. It's another game. But, but then it's also an art form. I do believe, like, 
I was really arrogant when when we were beginning because we were playing soul music and I thought this is where it's at this is really this is cool music and we're really cool band and uh, and I thought you two were great but that they were just kind of a new wave band from and that that and then I went to see them play in Wembley Stadium and it blew my mind because they made an art form. They had a stage that was beautiful. It was delicate. It was uh, there was no there was no big uh, you know it wasn't a big technological experience. It was like it was this it was the Joshua Tree, and so the stage was based on the on the tree. But it was it was like sails from a boat. It was very beautiful. It was very Irish. I thought it was very modern Irish, like the aesthetic of. It reminded me of of what my father loved about simplicity, minimal, good materials, but not necessarily overt symbolism, you know, simplicity. They really, and then the music that they played had space, great. So they, so by, by catering to that size, they created a beautiful art form. So I don't believe it's, it's cut and dry in any, in any kind of way, but I think I, it upsets me to see when a band loses faith in themselves and feels that they have to bump up everything in order to prove to somebody something that they just do well anyway. Yeah. It stopped being about the music and it starts being about the gimmicky, just the, mm. the visual, the, the mm. showmanship. And there's a balance that can be found. And they proved it. They proved that there. And Pink Floyd, I think, had done that before as well. That space. You know, you've got a big space, so use space. Play one note and then wait five seconds and then play the next note. And write the music that'll go. Uh, do you have any plans, any projects going? Well, yeah, I mean, I'm, I've, I've got a few projects. I've got a show called Rian. We made a, made a, made a show um, that's got that is dance and it's traditional music mostly um, and that has been traveling it's been to we've been to uh, London and New York and Sydney and Singapore and Hong Kong and Austria and Germany and Sweden and yeah is it well received? Do you yeah. Think every it's time we play in a different country, is Irish music and Irish tradition yeah. well received? Well, I believe in it. Anyway, I think if you believe, if anyone believes in what they're doing and they're feeling what they're doing, then the people who are listening to it will feel it. And there might be people who will have a resistance to it because it's folk music and it's like, <laughs> I don't want to touch it. But, no, I, I mean, it's... it's uh, I think when four or five people are up on stage and they're loving what they're doing and they're hearing it and they're playing, you know, and their fingers are communicating, like they've, they've given up thinking about what their just fingers are just doing. And so this is going on. It, it's folk music is for the people. It's people's music and Irish. So Irish music is, was born here. But it's everybody should will recognize it when when it's and I I think that's true of any music from any country that is kind of that has come that people play it not because it's cool it, it they just have to play it they have to 